You're listening to Macro Sunday, hosted by Andreas Steno. Happy Sunday, everyone, and welcome to the Macro Sunday podcast. I'm Andreas Steno, founder and uh, CEO of Steno Research, and uh, I'm joined by my colleague Emil Müller this week. Emil, good to see you, head of research here at uh, Steno Research, and we have a um, tremendous lineup (laughs) today with both Francis Donald, the... um, global chief economist of Manulife, joining us for a discussion on allocation and trading amidst a potential pause from central banks. And then we also have a former member of the Federal Reserve Committee, Dennis Lockhart, former president of the Atlanta Fed, joining us for an interview as well. So a perfect lineup for a discussion on central banks and the potential for a pause from the big central banks at this stage. Remember that this is your independent macro podcasts out there with some of the very best guests in the world. Uh, If you want to find out more about Steno Research and our offering, uh, we have an exclusive offer for the listeners uh, of this podcast. You can use Macro 3.0, Macro 30, uh, at stenoresearch.com to get 30% off your subscription. But enough about uh, Steno Research for now, Emil, <laughs> um, because we've had a whole pamphlet of central bank meetings this week. Yeah. Um, a pause or a skip from the Federal Reserve. Yeah. A pause or a skip from Bank of England. Yes. Um, and... It seems like the big central banks are moving slowly but surely towards concluding that this was the end of the hiking cycle. Do you share that sentiment? Mm, yes and no. So I think you're right that they're sort of that they're, they're, they're easing easing um, the foot from the pedal here, right? Mm. But on the other hand, they're quite ambiguous about guidance, yeah. and I think to an extent that too reflects their own insecurity about what basically is to come. And, well, as we well know, they all really screwed up in 2021. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think essentially they are risk averse here. So um, they're letting the market doing the bidding, uh, at least. Um, that, that's my general sense. Um, yeah. yeah. I uh, Just before we uh, went on air here, Emil, mm. I made a heat map over the pricing of central banks yeah. over the next year. Mm. And interestingly, we now have Japan as the most hawkish central bank <laughs> over the next 12 months Imagine, in huh? forward pricing. <laughs> yeah. um, it's not like markets expect them to hike interest rates no. um, by miles, but 24 basis points priced in. Yeah. So. Something is truly wrong if the market <laughs> <laughs> accepts the notion that the Japanese central bank will be the most hawkish central bank over the next 12 yeah. months. Would you have made that bet <laughs> in the start of the year that no. this situation would occur? No. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really, really interesting. Um, um, what I'm sort of um, thinking at this moment is the impact of oil. That's sort of the big quandary here. Yeah. And, uh, well, I've been basically stating this on this podcast for weeks, right? The big joker in the whole disinflation case is the impact of oil and energy. Mm. And here we are with, <laughs> with the oil just touching the $100 barrel or just uh, a bit below. Yeah. Now a bit now receding a bit, but we made quite a lot of money on, on the way up from summer. Huh? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think generally speaking, we've, really hit this point in the cycle pretty well in our own portfolio. Yeah. Could scarcely have been any better. Um, but I'm a bit more reluctant or say, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit more hesitant to commit to uh, to any reversal at this point. Yeah. Um, I'm still on the, on the recession uh, case, essentially. I yeah. think it will come. But I don't really feel like catching the knife falling. Um, uh, and <laughs> buying long ends has really been been the pain trade of 2023. So um, in Govies, yeah. yes, yeah, in Govies, uh, yes, yeah. yeah, it's been yeah. terrible. Yeah, um, don't remind me about yeah. it. So, <laughs> Traumatic. Um, I um, I visited 
Stavanger, yeah, uh, the did. Norwegian oil yeah. uh, capital, mm. earlier this week, and I um, had a lot of discussions with people involved in in, in oil and gas, and yeah. it's it's fair to say that the sentiment is pretty pretty decent. Mm. Um, it's also fair to say that I, that the consensus is now pretty uniform around oil breaching that 100 uh, mm. barrel mark yeah. at some point during the fourth quarter due to mm. a very obvious deficit in oil markets. Yeah. Um, the question here is whether the trend is running on fumes short term, given that um, everyone and their mother mm. uh, has suddenly flagged this case. Uh, I, I don't know where they were a couple of months ago, but uh, <laughs> uh, never mind. Yeah. Um, so I'm not necessarily of the view that energy is the buy right here, right now. No. No. Um, the question is then what to buy, and I, I'm I lack a bit of imagination. At this yeah, juncture, but um, yeah, we we we're still on a we're still on a sort of uh, uh, we're still on the deciding phase in that mm. point. But we do have some trades coming up. Um, I do think that, and that it's, that can't really be understated. That's or at least that my, that's my base case. That the impact from oil will be harder on the growth outlook than it will be on inflationary impulse. Yeah. And that sort of just fuels my 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 inner bear, which uh, I think will come out here in Q1. Yeah. So uh, despite us making quite a few money on this, um, I'm not particularly optimistic, yeah. I must say. And I think um, this is the perfect clue to move on to the discussion with our guests of the week. Um, first of all, um, we'll talk to Dennis Lockhart, former yeah. member of the Federal Open Market Committee, to get his view on whether the Fed is actually planning on a pause here. Um, mm. And then after that, we'll invite Frances Donnell um, to the discussion to get her view on how to asset allocate mm. amidst this uncertainty of whether a pause is upcoming or not from global central banks. Yeah. First of all, um, let's introduce Dennis Lockhart to the Macro Sunday. And as per usual, we have a bit of music uh, <laughs> when we introduce our guests. And uh, given that Dennis is the former president of the Atlanta Fed, why not? play a piece. Honor to introduce Mr. Dennis Lockhart, former president of the Atlanta Fed and former member of the Federal Market Open Committee, um, to this uh, show, Macro Sunday. Dennis, it's great to see you. Thank you very much for being with us here. Thank you, Andreas. <clears throat> Dennis, we are recording um, less than 24 hours after the FOMC decision uh, to skip the meeting yesterday in terms of interest rate hikes. What's your impression of the road ahead for the Federal Reserve here? Is it a pause uh, or is the modal outcome still another interest rate hike or two from here? Well, I'm not sure we, we can know the answer to that question. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, the committee and Chairman Powell left a lot of options open. They they penciled in one more uh, rate hike for 2023, but it sounded to me like it was very conditional on how the data evolve and and how some of the risks that are looming actually affect the economy. So we did not get I would what I'd call firm guidance. We mm. we we got suggestions and they kept their options open. If we look um, for clues ahead of November and December, um, the decisions there on, on a hike or not, 
what are some of the key variables that you will watch, Dennis, to assess whether another rate hike is uh, the base case or not? We're in a situation now where um, inflation could get sticky. There, there are, uh, for example, there are energy costs that are now coursing through the economy. Um, uh, they affect headline measurements of inflation, but I like to emphasize that there's energy in all kinds of pr- uh, energy costs and all kinds of products, both goods and services. And some of those probably have not been felt by companies and they'll be evaluating what they have to do with prices as as we go ahead. You know, we also have a situation with some labor militancy going on. We have two strikes currently uh, uh, in place and uh, we're in a situation where if other unions uh, feel they're losing real purchasing power, then they could very well uh, decide to, to strike. So that's an uncertainty. One of the things that Chair Powell emphasized so strongly is, one, lots and lots of uncertainty. There's always uncertainty, but certainly this juncture involves a fair amount of uncertainty. And then secondly, they're proceeding very carefully, which to me means that they might or might not make a move uh, before year end. It's simply going to depend on how all these factors uh, come together and, and evolve. Mm. Dennis, speaking of uh, energy costs, Paul has mentioned the importance of the price at the pump for inflation expectations at least a couple of times this year. How important do you find energy prices to be for the overall sentiment on inflation in the population? Well, it is uh, one of the, how should I put it, uh, accepted wisdom items that I've <laughs> learned when I was at the Fed that that uh, prices of gasoline at the pump are one of the most influential factors in consumer sentiment. Mm. And it does make a great deal of sense. Anyone who's pumped their own gas, as we do here in the United States, sits there and sees their money going away as they fill their tank. And that's got to have some uh, make some impression on the consumer. And as gasoline prices rise, it, it, it forces, or let's just say it, it crowds out other spending, and in many households, it's going to force economies that may not be entirely comfortable. So gasoline prices are a big factor in the minds of consumers. Mm. If we look at the state of the U.S. economy right now, um, your uh, former uh, employer, the Atlanta Fed, uh, runs a now-cast model currently predicting uh, tremendous growth numbers for the th- third quarter. Uh, other uh, regional FEDs um, have now cast models being less upbeat on the U.S. economy. But uh, I noted that the FMC statement yesterday upgraded the wording on growth to now being solid. So, Dennis, what is the overall state of the U.S. economy here? Is the economy still growing above trend or close to? Apparently above trend, mm. and by some measures, you cited the Atlanta mm. now cast and Atlanta uh, GDP now, by some measures, well above trend. Um, and I think uh, Powell admitted that the the growth in the economy has exceeded expectations, and I think they continue to have a view that in order to get inflation down to 2%, they need to slow the economy and slow demand. And they're not seeing that at the moment. Um, But they are seeing disinflation in the context of what is apparently a a very robust economy. Well, the the, the growth uh, numbers, it depends a little bit on which now cast you, you actually believe or follow. Um, I, I think it's a reasonable judgment that, that uh, the economy is growing strongly and uh, has momentum in all likelihood going into the fourth quarter. And that's one of the reasons I think they upgraded their full year growth number in the summary of economic projections. Mm. Dennis, if we look at the pros and cons of more or less explicitly pausing um, at this juncture with 
still strong growth in the economy, even some signs of a reacceleration in the most cyclical parts of the economy, if you ask me. What what are the pros and cons seen from the policy standpoint of, of pausing amid such a scenario? Powell and others have stated before <clears throat> that they have uh, something of a bias toward overshooting and then recalibrating as opposed to undershooting and then having to resume uh, rate hikes in reaction to uh, adverse developments in the economy. I think that continues to be their basic bias. So if they look at the pros and cons, I think they say it's better to go a little too far, uh, pick up on the signs that the economy is overreacting to what the, the policy stance is, and then cut back, calibrate, if you will. I think they, they simply feel that that is a better approach. It is sounder from the point of view of preserving credibility of the Fed, and it, it, will look up, it would look a lot less like a policy error than to pause and find that inflation resurges and the economy um, reacts badly to that, and as well as financial conditions through financial markets. So mm. it's a trade-off and it's a judgment call. I think he emphasized in the press conference that they they really look at the totality of, of the data and the situation and make a judgment. That's very much the way it felt to me when I was there. Uh, but that's the bias, and I think that's the way they view the pros and cons. Mm. Dennis, to which extent um, does the committee look towards market pricing uh, of the future path of interest rates? Um, we've had an ongoing uh, situation with cuts being priced, say, nine to 12 months down the road. It's been an ongoing discussion also on press conferences with Powell, how to view this uh, pricing of interest rate cuts down the road. Is the forward pricing important for the committee and is it something that the committee is uh, aware of and watches on an ongoing basis? It's a consideration, mm. it's input, but in my experience, the committee doesn't believe they can do much about it. Quite yeah. frankly, markets markets will be markets. Markets will dictate that pricing. And it is uh, probably not very sound to uh, be in a constant action-reaction mode with markets, trying to get markets to change uh, their pricing and, and put the finan overall financial conditions where the Fed would prefer, that's just not something I think they have confidence they can do. Mm. So obviously, overall financial conditions really are what affect the economy. They try to influence them, but they really don't get into a minuet with the markets. Mm. Dennis, in, in relation to this discussion on um, on gasoline prices, headline inflation versus core inflation, and now that we see a, a pickup in um, in oil prices and and ultimately also retail gasoline prices again, how important is core inflation relative to headline inflation in the decision making within the committee? I think members of the committee believe that core inflation is much closer to underlying inflation, which mm. is really what they're seeking to understand. Uh, in inflation, uh, inflation data uh, are relatively volatile. They ver uh, the data vary from month to month. There's a fair amount of noise. There are idiosyncratic effects in, in the numbers, and they can't react to every one of those uh, every one of those surface elements. What they are trying to do is understand the underlying trend of broad prices in the economy. And so core is closer to underlying than headline is. They factor out first order energy and food prices and then look at, uh, um, look at the core inflation numbers. 
In yesterday's press conference, uh, I thought there was an interesting comment made by Powell in reaction to a question of uh, what are they going to do if they don't get any data because of a government shutdown. Yeah. And, and, and in that response, he pointed out that they can look at month over month data, sh short term data, and uh, piece together a picture of what's going on in inflation. I have always maintained that even though we fixate on the core number or the headline number, it's much uh, less simplistic than that. It is really a dashboard of indicators from which they synthesize an overall view of a fundamental or underlying inflation. Hmm. If we... Um Add the fiscal policy to uh, the mix here in the discussion, Dennis. Um, many have noted how the deficit has grown in size, uh, also in a way that is um, out of sync with the current cycle, uh, in a sense. Uh, a growing deficit with a falling uh, unemployment, say on a trend basis over the past three, four quarters. How relevant is the fiscal policy mix for the uh, monetary policy mix? And uh, is the fiscal policy mix an issue for the Federal Reserve at this juncture? Well, I would say that, and Powell addressed this in, uh, in so many words in his press conference, the fiscal situation is a, a factor in what is going on in the broad economy. It, has a, a role in in total demand, total domestic demand. Um, also, it can be a shock element, uh, particularly if we do have a government shutdown. Having said that, they don't really try in a tit for tat to respond to the fiscal situation. Mm -hmm. They just factor it into the broad economic outlook and then try to do their job in terms of monetary policy with fiscal influences part of the total picture. That's the way I, they think of it. And, uh, and of course, uh, as you saw uh, or have seen, uh, Chair Powell is very, very careful to stay out of fiscal matters. It's not something that the Fed should be commenting on. No, uh, he's been very clear about that. Uh, that's that's for sure, Dennis. If we uh, if we look into 2024 uh, and even beyond that, uh, one of the discussions being raised right now is the signals being sent by the long term projections in the dot plot. Um, in the update yesterday, the uh, long term uh, projections stayed at two and a half percent in the consensus estimate or the median estimate uh, of the members of the committee. Um, is this long-term projection in the dot plot an important tool for the Fed? And do you think they will utilize that tool into 2024 if they want to send a signal of higher for longer? I don't think it's an important tool. No. Um, and um, Chair Powell tried, I think, to, um, how should I put it, to, uh, to, de-emphasize and any uh, literal conclusions to be drawn from the longer term projections. Now I'll put this in my own words. You're never going to hear a central banker uh, in office say this, but beyond uh, a year or 18 months, it's really guesswork mm. uh, and it's uh, the, the projections are not to be taken literally. They just are a sense of what the direction of things might be, highly conditional. They, uh, those projections will be revised several times as those dates get closer and closer. You know, in my own words, I would say the public should not take the longer term projections very seriously. Mm. For the road ahead, Dennis, um, I'd like to conclude with a um, discussion 
on the risk of a recession into 2024. It's been on everybody's lips throughout this year. It seems like that risk of a recession keeps getting postponed. But to which extent is this risk of a recession on the radar of the committee? Um, and how is monetary policy affected by affected by this risk? Well, I think I think uh, as one scenario among several, a recession is very much on the minds of the committee, mm. and that's why Powell is emphasizing that they're going to proceed very carefully, and that although they penciled in one more rate hike uh, this year, and I think he said uh, more likely than not they will and uh, carry th carry through with that. Mm. Uh, it, he made it sound very conditional and not something that was uh, carved in stone in any way. Uh, and that's because they recognize they're at a point where where they do have some recession risk. Now, I want to, again, get on my soapbox here a little bit and say there are recessions and there are recessions, and we tend to use the word without defining the severity and the length of the recession. Uh, at this point, it, I think the most plausible recession would be short and relatively shallow. Mm. And uh, I think that is to be avoided, if at all possible. It was an interesting exchange in the press conference around soft landing, and he was emphatic about saying they're trying for a soft landing. But I, I am sure that the risk of a mild recession is on the minds of the committee. It does not seem terribly plausible that a severe recession could occur unless we have out of the blue shocks that affect the economy. Mr. Dennis Lockhart, former uh, president of the Atlanta Fed and former member of the Federal Open Market Committee, thank you very much for being with us here at the Macro Sunday podcast to review the decision taken by the FOMC this week. It was a pleasure hosting you. Thank you. Thank you. What a tremendous honor to be able to host Dennis Lockhart here at uh, Macro Sunday Meal. Um, yeah. Knowledgeable guy with loads of experience from the committee. Um, Quite unique insight, eh? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And um, the big question now amidst this uncertainty, whether this was a pause or not, is how to asset allocate given that uncertainty. Mm. And... If we look at, we've made a study this week on our platform, Emil, on, on returns in various sort of rage regimes. Mm. If this is actually a pause, mm. you could construe that as pretty decent use for risk assets, right? Yeah. Could at be. least if you use the 2007 playbook, right? Yeah, it, it's yeah, it's it's an event for, for some relief. Sure. Mm. Yeah. Um, But short term. Yeah, it's, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it, it's it's not it's not going to last if that case replays, obviously. <laughs> But um, yeah, and, and and I mean, right now I really get those very very late cyclical vibes with yeah. Yeah. weird, extreme moves in traded food commodities. For example, mm. uh, look at the price of OJ. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God. I mean, it's <laughs> it's cheaper to buy champagne now than OJ, more or less. <laughs> yeah. And uh, look at the price of olive oil, uh, sugar, stuff like that. Mm. But then, on the, the other hand, look at inflation expectations. Mm. Are they totally unanchored? Nah, hardly. Mm. Yet oil is really, you know, up there in the ninety to to hundred dollar barrel range, right? Mm. That usually follow one another, and I think the fact that those two are starting to diverge. Mm. It's sort of a hint for me that the market does not really see uh, see demand lasting at, the, at those price levels. Yeah. So um, that's essentially why I'm well, well, another reason why I am bearish yeah. overall. So uh, yeah, it's you know, <laughs> it's yeah. I know I'm a bit depressing to listen to, but uh, <laughs> despite you know, that's where I'm at. Yeah, I'd, I need some champagne after this, yeah. or <laughs> beer or whatever. Emil, let's uh, invite Francis Donnell mm. um, to take part in this discussion on mm. uh, trading and asset allocation amidst this discussion on uh, on whether this was a pause or not from the Federal Reserve. Yeah. Um, Francis is the Global Chief Economist um, at Manulife Investment Management. So uh, basically, um, behind a lot of money in asset allocation. Yeah, um, be curious and, what she has to say. Yeah, and 
to be honest, Frances is just a shining star. I really love her takes on the global economy and um, asset allocation. So very much look forward to this discussion. Yep. And again, as per usual, we introduce our guests with a piece of music. And um, since Frances is Canadian, global chief economist and strategist of Manulife Investment Management to the Macro Sunday podcast. It's so great to see you again, Frances. Thank you for, for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to join you. Thank you very much. Francis, we are recording hot on the heels of a um, big week in global central banking. And um, most people seem to conclude that we're amidst some kind of, if not coordinated, pause from the big central banks, then at least approaching a pause. So is it feasible from an investment perspective to bet on that pause here? You know, the, the short answer is you can bet on anything <laughs> <laughs> that you want to. There's all sorts of manners to do that. The uh, Maybe the question that I ask is, uh, sh should we bet mm. on a pause? But more importantly, um, one of the most humbling things of sitting with asset managers all day is how little they care about um, the Fed doing anything or any central banker occurring in isolation. So certainly this morning we had a team call and we talked about the Fed meeting and uh, it's, we talked about all the core themes that came up. You know, I said, this Fed is going to be a reluctant cutter. Mm. Uh, I do believe that they will enter an easing cycle in 2024. I do believe they are probably done. Maybe they have one more hike in them, but they're going to wait longer and go less than they have in the past. We talked about how wildly optimistic their economic forecasts are even relative to consensus. I mean, they have the unemployment rate virtually moving, you know, statistically nothing next year. I find that hard to believe. We could be at their <laughs> 2024 forecast next month. Uh, we could be at 4.1 next month. Um, and also how much more optimistic that is for markets. So when you talk about betting on the Fed pause, I, I would never go to the team and say, we're going to add duration on a Fed pause. I would say, look, do you know how much easier it is for the Fed to be disappointing, disappointed than for the market to be disappointed in the next three to six months? And if you really want to kind of construct the most bullish outlook, I would say what you really want to bet for is a forecast or a, oh, sorry, an outcome between the market's more pessimistic forecast, but below the Fed's optimistic one. Then, then your risk assets get the jolt of uh, better earnings outlooks and better growth, and then you also get lower interest rates. That would be the most ideal scenario that I could bet on. That would be really good. And we talked about um, that long run neutral rate. Kind of seems like economic nerddom, <laughs> which it is a little bit. Um, but we talked about how significant it is that the Fed could be pausing, to use your term, but also tightening at the long end by lifting the the long run neutral rate. And what kind of trade that looks like. There's a, a gentleman on my team, Alex Persino, and he has a line that I love. He says, uh, when the Fed starts cutting, you won't need to ask why. <laughs> and I love this because it effectively uh, changes the narrative around, is the Fed pausing or cutting to why are they pausing or cutting? Are they pausing because they want to avoid a recession or are they pausing because we've had a, a credit event? Uh, so I, I can't advocate trading a pause. Um, what I am happy to advocate for is that you probably have uh, another three to four months where you're in hawkish pause or one more rate hike. And while, you know, if I went on TV and I said, we might pause or we might have 25 basis points more, they would never accept that. A portfolio manager will always accept that as an outlook. Okay, so the balance of risks is one more, but we're probably going to stay around current levels. Uh, combined with uh, some math around inflation, Andreas, I read your work. I know you could probably school me on all the math around why the next three months might be a little bit more difficult on inflation. Uh, so that, tr that trade is very different. 
Yes, it comes with a pause, uh, but that's what, not what we would trade. Uh, and then when we get into 2024, I would probably start talking to the teams quite a bit about uh, what an easing cycle looks like and when we would start to pile back into risk assets. So I I'm not sure if that answered your question. Is it feasible to trade a pause? Yes. But in practical terms, would you do that? Probably not. <laughs> It, uh, it did answer the question to a, a very large extent, I think. And um, in relation to this discussion, I also find um, you mentioning the recession risks very interesting because we've had a year of continuously wrong-footed assumptions on the U.S. economy, especially when it comes to growth. Uh, it's been the Bloomberg economic consensus outcome for both Q1, Q2, and Q3 uh, a recession. And yet here we are uh, towards the end of September without a recession. So, Francis, given that this recession risk keeps getting postponed, how do you deal with that uh, from an asset allocation perspective? And is it something you care about? Oh, yeah. The first thing you do is grovel and ask for forgiveness. <laughs> I don't know. As you're describing this scenario, I'm thinking of that common meme is this movie about me? Uh, so full disclosure, and anyone who follows my work would know that we began talking about recession risk. Um, in the summer of 2022, we began to see signs that by mid to late 2023, we should be expecting a material deceleration in growth. Now, industry lessons, if we ever, maybe we'll write a book together one day, industry lessons, even if you see a recession, don't talk about it too early. Because even if you believe it'll happen at the end of 2023, if you talk about it for a year and a half, everyone will say you're wrong, even if you were not end up technically being wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but what effectively happened? So, the reasons that we began to think about recession risk as early as the end of 2022 is because we were looking at uh, effectively having achieved the peak in a variety of leading economic indicators and expecting that this cycle would behave not exactly like all cycles, but would resemble uh, basic economic process and data. What has occurred in practice and why people feel that those who have called for a recession are wrong is that the uh, the lag time, and maybe I should take a step back and say, you know, this morning I had a portfolio manager say to me, well, given that the economy is less sensitive to interest rates than it has been in the past or rate hikes, won't it be less sensitive to rate cuts? And I said, I'm going to push back against your premise. I don't believe this economy is less sensitive to interest rates in any material way, maybe at the margin around housing. I just believe that the lag is substantially longer than it has been in the past for a variety of reasons. I'm not going to say anything that other guests on your podcast have not discussed. We've got labor shortages, excess savings, massive fiscal stimulus, pro-cyclical fiscal stimulus. Housing is a smaller share of the economy than it has been. And we're still in a post-COVID environment. So I just finally sold the fitness equipment I bought during COVID and used three times at 60% off on Facebook Marketplace. And we've been wanting to take our kids to Disney World for four years and we're finally going this year. So uh, we're still in a post-COVID environment where we're experiencing the good services rebound. And as a result, the lag time between manufacturing and services, I think, has been extended pretty significantly. Mm -hmm. So if you were just going to look at manufacturing, you would say, well, I nailed the call because manufacturing has been a recession for eight months or so. Um, and most economic models used by most shops from most mainstream economies are heavily biased towards manufacturing as a really solid leading indicator. So one of two things, or both things is happening. If you used your standard leading indicators, you would say a recession is coming in 2023. And then you would also, not only would you have been wrong on that, but you would also say we're coming out of the recession and we're going to see a reacceleration mm. because that's what manufacturing is due. Mm. You would be wrong twice. At least that's what I think is going to happen. Mm. Uh, when you try to adjust your models, you can't throw them out. Some people are throwing out the models saying literally nothing will work. I'm not in that camp. I don't believe it's a standard environment. I also don't believe we should throw out everything we know. If someone tells me I'm making less money or I lose my job, I'm not going to go to restaurants as much. If a company is told you're having revenues and profit margins squeezed, they're going to cut down on costs. 
let's not throw out basic economic principles, but we can acknowledge that manufacturing and services is desynchronized and therefore our standard ways of timing recessions have not worked. Um, so you shouldn't be wrong going into it and then use the same system to say you're wrong going out. Another thing that's happening is I think we're way too obsessed with the word recession. Mm. I don't feel that in practical terms, it really matters whether we have two quarters of negative GDP. So in Canada, for example, uh, in Q2, uh, we got a negative GDP and we're tracking currently for 0% GDP in Q3. Is it technically a recession? No. Is it still a really bad economic environment? Yes. Just this morning, I was talking to the team and saying, hey, you know, let's take a really big step back. I can argue for why I think we're going to get three quarters of negative GDP in the United States, probably starting in Q4, maybe in Q1. And I can show you 50 charts on my high conviction of that view. But I don't really need to do that to tell you how to trade this market. What I need to tell you is that the best of the growth that we've experienced is behind us. Inflation is going to be flat or lower not substantially higher. We're not going back to where we were a year and a half ago. And rates may move up a little bit, but are probably not going back or not going to be moving materially higher in the way that they have in the past two years. That basic story is way more important than are we getting two quarters of negative GDP. In fact, I would take it one step forward and say, from an investment management perspective, not as a human being who's sympathetic to other human beings, but from an investment management perspective, it is much easier for me to trade a two to three quarter recession with a central bank easing cycle and then a rebound than it is for me to trade a muddle through 0.1% GDP growth that extends for four quarters. That scares me way more <laughs> than a standard economic recession. So I mean, I can I can fight the recession call. I can argue both sides of it like the best of them. But we are way too focused on nailing this arbitrary definition of a bad environment than we are focusing on the momentum behind growth. And why do we care about growth? The only reason I have my job is because I'm supposed to be able to say growth is going to do this and therefore earnings is going to go do this. Mm -hmm. That is why I exist in my current role. It's actually not to predict GDP. Mm -hmm. Francis, this diverging trend between manufacturing and services seen over the past, say, three, four quarters with services doing much better than manufacturing. Let's assume that we flip this trend upside down into 2024, manufacturing doing much better than services and the recession arriving um, due to a payrolls recession in services. How do you think markets would would react to such a scenario with the cyclical part of the economy doing better than the services? Uh, most important question that I think about every single day is what finally spooks risk assets? Is it the last rate hike? I don't think so. I don't think it's 25 basis points. I think it's the first negative payrolls number. Mm. Um, but sentiment is a powerful beast. And, you know, it's, I think the evolution of a strategist for the first 10 years of their careers in the beginning as a strategist, you start saying what you think central banks should do. And then and then you realize, no, it's not about me. That's a difficult transition for all of us in our 20s. And then you say, oh, no, no, I'm supposed to guess what the central bank will do. And then uh, as you mature even further, you realize, no, it's not even that. It's I have to guess what markets will expect the central bank to do. <laughs> so you kind of go through this three-stage evolution. And, and then I think you've achieved boss level and you've arrived as a, as a strategist, right? <laughs> so I spend a lot of time thinking about what does it take? And I, if I had to choose one indicator, I would say that it's jobs. I think that's difficult. Headlines around jobs, uh, negative non-farm payrolls, because I think this tends to negate the soft landing thesis to a certain extent. And right now, softly mapping, we see this occurring around January. So depending on what your time horizon of your portfolio is, even portfolio managers that are very long risk right now, and many are, and this is not a terrible idea at all, 
you trade off of momentum, you trade off of sentiments, you can trade off of technicals. These are smart ways to trade tactical portfolios. In fact, probably better than trying to guess what the retail sales number is going to be tomorrow and is then substantially revised anyways. So what are we all doing? Um, but we talk about our, our plans. So what are we going to do? What are the triggers for us to de-risk? And what is our plan to do so? And when we do rest, how are we going to do that? So we have all of these contingency plans, not unlike if you own a home, you buy a fire extinguisher and you say, well, if I see flames, my fire extinguisher is here and this is how I'm going to do it. And maybe you rehearse. We leave out this door and we go, remember in school, we had to go say, here's a fire drill. We're going to go outside and stand here. This is what we're doing across all of our portfolios now. Can we get out? How fast can we get out? And what's it going to take for us to get out? And if you just looked at positioning, you would not get a good sense of how much behind the scenes is happening to prepare for that eventuality. You would just say they're very bullish. Mm. You would not see the behind the scenes conversations that occur there. I, I even forget what your original question was. I think, what does it take for people to, to worry? My sense is um, services will be a more powerful sentiment impactor, even if it is technically not the same as manufacturing. I should make one other comment here. Um, one of the stories I try to explain to clients quite a bit is even if I have a recession call and even if you hear about recessions and even if a recession materializes, it is not going to look like past recessions. Mm -hmm. And for one of the reasons is manufacturing is probably going to be stronger. Mm -hmm. If we even hit the technical recession, we'll experience the handoff manufacturing to services recession. The unemployment rate is probably not going to rise by as much as it has in the past. And I think there'll be a lot of sector and company specific opportunities that exist within this broad term recession. The other is timelines matter quite a bit. So for the bulk of institutional clients, I was in California last week. They all, every client I met with said, yeah, I think there's going to be a recession. And that was like 30 seconds of our one hour meeting. The rest of the meeting was, what is your five-year outlook? Mm. What is the neutral rate? What is potential growth? Mm. Because long-term investors who are focused on pensions and retirements and target date funds, they've navigated recessions. They will prepare a little bit to take opportunity that exists within a recession. But what they need to know is, on a five- to ten-year basis minimum, do I need to be making asset allocation discussions? So... The question is really important. You know, what does this recession look like? What's the trigger for risk off? But I have a view, and it's a bias, that the big sticky money in this world is much more focused on the, as I called it, economic nerddom of that long run neutral rate and what it means for their fixed income allocations, what it means for private assets. We used to call those alternatives. Mm -hmm. No one calls those alternatives anymore, which I think is telling. Um, what does that rebound look like? And what's our destination after this blip in the road? I don't know if that's fair, but th this is this is a preoccupation mm. for many of my clients and also for our longer term portfolios. Francis, I'd like to uh, conclude with your take on illiquid assets amidst all this. Um, since you're Canadian, um, you obviously <laughs> uh, you're obviously a subject matter expert on um, the things that are developing in uh, in um, Canadian real estate right now. Uh, it's evident, even seen from the outside, that there is a, an immense political pressure on Bank of Canada not to hike interest rates anymore to try and contain the downside risks in in Canadian housing. So, what do you make of illiquid assets, real estate, um, amidst this high for longer scenario for interest rates? Uh, you know, I've been doing this for a while. I don't think anyone outside of Canada has ever asked me about the Canada story. So first of all, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but there's some really interesting things happening that I think actually, um, certainly, you know, we all try not to have biases, but certainly bias my perspective on the world and bias my um, understanding and perspective around central banks. So first, I I mean, I won't go too much into it, but um, Canada's mortgage market has a variety of very strange products. So if you're like, oh, that sounds like the episode the US experienced not so long ago, there are shades of this, right? Mm. So. Um, 
you know, 30 percent of roughly a third of Canadians own their home, a third rent and a third have mortgages. But in Canada, we have five year predominantly five-year fixed mortgages. So unlike the United States, where my colleagues in the U.S. have locked in at like sub-3% mortgages for 30 years and will never move, in Canada, you reset every five years, or there's a substantial share that have what are called variable rate mortgages. Um, what are called we variable rate, except that in Canada, the bulk of those variable rate mortgages actually have fixed payments. So your payment doesn't change. What happens is that they increase the share of interest in your payment. Mm. Now, problematically for these products, um, rates rose faster than anybody expected. And the share of interest on a variety of these variable rate mortgages, so-called, began to exceed 100%. Now, the fine print on these products tells them if that happens, you're going to get a call from your bank that says you have to pay the difference. You can't have a negative mortgage. That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So initially, about a year and a half ago, a lot of economists, including those on my team, were really worried that there was going to be a shock to the market because a ton of Canadians were going to get calls saying you owe us thousands of dollars out of the blue and you signed that contract. But instead, what banks did, so this was a bank, individual bank decision, is they said, well, we're not going to do that. We're going to extend the amortization of the loan. So there are several banks in Canada now whose mortgage book now has a significant share between 20 and 30 percent of the mortgages on their balance sheet are longer than 30 years. And regulators are starting to step in to effectively say, that's risky. What has happened here? We have these products we didn't really understand that existed within the system. Now, uh, there are others who will give you a much more succinct and detailed overview of this. And maybe it seems like, well, what does this have to do with global investing? At the same time that this is happening, um, Canada has let in uh, the largest amount of uh, immigrants, almost population adjusted ever. So over a million. Mm. Now, Canada has always prided itself as actually having higher potential growth because it offset weak demographics with immigration. And it has been lauded, including by myself and other economists, as having the right idea. Let's supplement your demographic problem with immigration. But the immigration numbers have come so high that the demand uh, is so substantially above supply in Canada. So it's just you know, hundreds and thousands of missing homes that exist. So why do I mention this? You're saying, well, what does this have to do with investing? Well, the Bank of Canada has had the most aggressive rate hike cycle effectively ever, especially debt adjusted. Uh, those who have true variable rate mortgages, which is a few, are significantly hampered. Confidence is tanking. Canada's already in a recession, but the housing market hasn't cracked yet. So the Bank of Canada has a problem, which is the economy is deteriorating, it's heading towards a recession, but housing is still inflated and contributing to costs. I suspect the very difficult conversation the Canadians are going to have is central banks cannot control everything in this case are not the main drivers of the housing market. And in Canada in particular, the bulk of the inflation that we were experiencing was coming from imported inflation from global and supply side factors, much more than the United States. So we, here we have a central bank that has told us over and over again, we can and we will bring inflation back down to 2%. But it is fighting, it is fighting floods in Libya, droughts in Brazil, a federal policy of immigration, which is you know, standard deviations above anything we've seen from any other country and mortgage products that were developed by banks outside of the Bank of Canada's purview. So it's not working. And if we use the standard approach to central banking, we should say, well, they just haven't raised interest rates high enough. But I've been very vocal here in my own country, how many people have to lose their job for us to realize that central banking is not always the right answer for an economy. Mm -hmm. How many lives have to be ruined? How many people have to force sell their home? How many people have to line up in a food bank for us to say, maybe interest rates isn't the solution to this problem. And interest rates is a solution to a lot of problems, but it's not the solution to all of our problems. 
And as I think bigger picture, you know, what are the lessons you can glean from that? Mm. I strongly suspect, and this is like a moonshot idea. So if we were having drinks and I was off the record, neither of which we are doing right now, I might say that I have this long-term view that the credibility crisis for central banks will never have been the rise in inflation that occurred post-COVID. It will be the central bank's inability to decrease it sustainably to 2% because we will all collectively outside of our field come to realize that there are certain inflations and certain problems that central banks cannot solve. That will be a complete change in the narrative that has existed for the past 40 years. Mm. And I suspect it will change the way that we think about broad market moves. It also means I'll probably get asked a little bit less, what's the Fed going to do at its next meeting? And get asked more important questions like, what is the productive capacity of our economies moving forward? But maybe that's my own bias coming to play. We'll certainly make sure to ask you that question next time you visit <laughs> the Macro Sunday <laughs> podcast, Francis. Francis Donald, uh, Chief global um, economists and strategist at Manulife Investment Management. Thank you very much for being with us here at Macro Sunday. Thanks for having me. And Emil, just to um, round off the discussions <laughs> after both uh, having um, Dennis and, and Francis um, on the show here. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're looking into a few possible traits at this juncture. Yeah. Being short the yen is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, being short transportation is another. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a few lacked energy proxies. Yeah. Long the Nokia. Yeah. Um, the last leg up. Yeah. 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 But in in any case, we're we're kind of in a, in an agreement here that we are very, very late late cycle now. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to commit all uh, for no. another for another leg up, that's for sure. Um, so yeah, yeah, you know, um, taking some some chips off the table, take some profits, and then you know just await for the things to turn. I yeah. think that's that's prudent advice here. Yeah, yeah. we shorted Euronoki on Thursday. Um, we're looking into shorts in the transportation sector. Yeah, and um, we're also looking into a carry trade being short the Japanese yen versus a nation peer. Yeah. Still discussing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think <laughs> those are the words for this week, Emil. Um, hopefully, yeah. we have a bit more clarity next week. Oh, let's hope so. At yeah. least we, we have some, at least we, we, we do have some uh, some winners to uh, to celebrate. So, uh, you indeed, know, we've done well. So, yeah. So, no reason to. Thankfully, so. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> therefore, we don't maybe even need to play our disclaimer this week, but uh, why don't we play it anyway? <laughs> okay. uh, remember yeah, that know. every time we suggest something, <laughs> our trade ideas might either be... <laughs> sometimes may be good, sometimes may be shit. I almost forgot uh, yeah. Gennaro Gattuso uh, Gennaro. this week. If you want more of Steno Research and uh, access to our live portfolio, access to our data hub, access to our 15 to 20 articles a week, etc., um, then remember that you can use Macro30 as a coupon code to get 30% off your subscription at stenoresearch.com. Calm. This was all for Macro Sunday for this week. Emil Müller, great seeing you again. Cheers, mate. Cheers. My name is Andreas Steno, and I'll see you again next week. <laughs>